Hello, my friends. This is Jeff Yaldon, your celebrity teen and family life coach and suicide prevention expert. I'm a youth motivational speaker and the author of Your Life Matters and the host of The Jeff Yaldon Show. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this content in this video that you're about to watch. Four tips on saving a teenager's life from suicide. Hey, listen, I hope you share this video, please, with families, with parents, with teenagers, with student leaders, coaches, principals, administrators, counselors. Everybody needs to watch this video because it is then that we can become part of the solution and we can save a child's life or we can save the life of another individual. Suicide does not free us from the pain. Suicide only transfers the pain to another person. Teen hurt is happening so fast at lightning speed that we can't even fathom. It's unimaginable. With social media and cell phones, with the expectations, I have many theories as to why suicide is more prevalent than ever before. We're going to get into this video. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you share it. Okay, my friends, so let's move on here to this action plan. Here you are. You're the gatekeeper. You're the change agent. We're going to be the vehicle that takes a suspicion that someone might not be feeling good. Someone is dealing with depression or things aren't going right. They're just not their normal self. So number one, you're identifying the person. That's important. And identifying the person, I think it's really important to understand some of the traits of possible suicide or depression. I think they're often similar. One of the things I say, but I don't want to leave with this, it's common sense. If you suspect someone might be hurting, they're probably hurting. And some of the traits that I want to go over, the signs or symptoms of depression are withdrawing from family and friends, losing interest in social or extracurricular activities, a lack of energy, feeling tired most of the time, anxiety, irritability, sadness, anger, feelings of sadness for much of the time, significant fluctuation in someone's weight, sleep pattern changes, physical pains and aches, sickness, even though there's nothing physically wrong, indifference about the future, afraid of being a burden on people. Also, social media is an issue today where you see some people on your friend list, they're having fun, the photos, they're laughing, they're having a great time, and you're sitting there thinking, well, what? I'm not having a great time. Social media is... Research is saying that social media, whether it be Facebook or Instagram, Snapchat or Twitter, often makes someone feel inadequate when they compare their lives to other people. So if they're complaining about something and friendships, that's another sign or trait to be on the lookout for. Okay, so we just talked about signs and symptoms of teen depression, teen suicide. Let's talk about the causes of suicide teen suicide. The most often cause is depression. Depression often leaves someone with feelings of hopelessness, uh, strong anxiety, along with feelings of being trapped in a life that one can't handle. Oftentimes, people believe that suicide is the only way to solve their problems. The pressures of life seem too much to cope with and some people look at suicide as a welcome escape of the pain, but really, like I said earlier, the pain just transfers it to another person. Hey, listen, my friends, I know life is hard. It's, it's hard for you. It's hard for me. It's hard for our friends. But suicide is a permanent action to a temporary problem. And I have many theories on teen suicide and suicide. I think it's coping skills and problem-solving skills. I think it's a lack of courage. We're afraid to fail. I think it's social media and cell phones. I think it's expectations, but that's no, neither here nor there. We're talking about the bottom line. Depression and mental disorder is 90% of the problem in all suicides.
and some other factors that may contribute to suicide is divorce of parents, violence in the home, inability to find success at school, feeling of inadequacy or worthlessness or rejection by friends and peers, social media plays a role in that, substance abuse, death of someone close to the person, the suicide of a friend or someone that he or she knows or someone that they may know online, disappointment, afraid of being that burden on their family. Here are some signs that maybe the teenager or the person may be considering an attempted suicide. Maybe they're giving away valuable possessions. They could be talking about death or suicide, and they might even be doing it in a joking manner. It's not something that we should take lightly. It's not even something that we should joke about. Maybe they have planned ways of which they would decide to kill themselves. They express worry that nobody cares about him or her. Maybe they've attempted suicide in the past, dramatic changes in personality or behavior, a withdrawal from interaction with friends and family. They're showing signs of depression. They show signs of a substance abuse problem or begins to act recklessly and engage in risk-taking behaviors. Having said that, Let's move on from the step of now we've identified the person, what's next? Okay, so the next step is having the courage to approach the person and question the person. I want you to think about if someone comes to you and they come to you in a, in a, in a, in a bold, tight way and they put you on the defensive, okay? I want you to approach this person in a way that you're opening your heart. You care. You want to be compassionate and kind. You don't want to do it with people around. You want to do it where you can be one-on-one. -on -one. You don't want to be doing this on text or email. At least you want to do it over the phone. At, at the very best, I want you to be able to question that person face-to-face. Simple questions could be simply like, hey, I've just noticed lately you haven't, you haven't been, you know, the person that I know you are. You just seem kind of withdrawn and, you know, you're not engaging and, and you just, you seem distant. I just want to make sure you're okay. Or another thing is, hey, I'm just, you know, I'm feeling that you're, you're, there's something going on. I want to help you. I'm, I'm here for you. Can I do anything? You know, sometimes questioning someone is about you just being present and opening your ears and saying, I care. I want to help you. So when you get into the conversation with someone, you know, make sure you're on equal terms, equal levels, and this is your heart to theirs. Don't ever get into the conversation and say, well, you're, you're not going to kill yourself tonight, are you? Uh, that's that's going to do nothing. They're going to be in the defensive, like, oh, uh, no. But how about something like if you're going to ask the question, you might talk about pain and anxiety and the stresses and the pressures and be like, yeah, you know, sometimes, you know, I just feel like so overwhelmed with the marking period coming to an end. I've got this test. I've got to turn in this paper in colleges. And I just feel like sometimes it's just so much and I just, I can't breathe. You ever, you ever feel like you just want to go to bed at night and just like never wake up? Now that's a very soft way into asking the question. And if the person says yes, then we're going to go to the next step. Okay, so the third step in this process, you've got that gut feeling and you just sense that it's the right thing to do to further the conversation. Well, the third step is persuading them to get help. Hey, my friends, it's perfectly okay to ask for help. That's what parents do to their children, teachers do to their students, coaches do to the athletes, and counselors do to their clients. Some people are afraid to open up because they don't think that other people don't understand or they don't want to be a burden to somebody else. So here's where you can maybe share a point in your life where you had someone help you. And I think one of the other responsibilities that we have is to encourage them to lose the ego again. 
and don't be afraid to ask for the help. What's important here, when you're at that point where you're persuading them to get help, you don't leave them. At, at the very least, if you have to leave or they walk away from you, make sure you get a verbal commitment from them that they will speak to a higher power, such as maybe their parents, maybe they're going to call their counselor, maybe they're going to go to the doctor right away, maybe they're going to go to the emergency room. At the very least, get that verbal commitment. In persuading them and you're there, you take them. You walk them through the process. That really shows that you care and that you're invested. And that's something that's important at this critical point in the, the stage that this person is in. Persuade them to get help and, and take them. It could be the, the teacher. It could be a parent. It could be a counselor. It could be a nurse. It, it, the hospital. On social media. Don't do this via texting or email or messaging. Get on the phone with them because texting and you just you're not sensing emotion. You can't really be compassionate and understanding. It just goes back and forth and back and forth and message can get misconstrued or something. So if you're a student, go to your parents right away. Call their parents right away. And you might be thinking, but Jeff, I, I no, Jeff. listen, it's the right thing to do. They might not appreciate it in the moment, but I promise you, they're going to appreciate the gesture and they're going to know where your heart was because you were concerned for their well-being. So we persuade them and we stay with them. And, and if we can't stay with them, we get that verbal commitment. The final step in this whole process is to refer them to the right people. In their frame of mind, they might not be thinking clearly. If you're a student, get to a parent, get to a teacher, the nurse, a counselor, go to the administration, refer them and be present with them. Well, if you're a parent, and this may be another parent, maybe this is a, a, a teacher to a friend or a, a, a co-worker to a co-worker, we're going to refer them and it's simply maybe you go to human resources, maybe you talk to another administrator and uh, you're just going to refer them to maybe a doctor or a counselor in the area. And if worse comes to worse, always, always have the number to the suicide hotline with you. That number is on the bottom of the screen. It's 1-800-273-TALK. It's 1-800-273-8255. And in your gut, remember, you can always call 911. I'm Jeff Yaldin, suicide prevention expert. I'm glad you listened to this video, and I hope you share it with others. Thank you.